Well, beloved and friends, as Christ's church, we are sojourners. This is not our world. We are sojourners. That means we are journeying in a place not our own. But we are sojourners not for the sake of suffering, not for the sake of sojourning, not for the sake of submitting. We are sojourners for the sake of the Savior. We are sojourners that intentionally live, mindful that this is not our home, in order that the way we live here makes much of Christ. Living for Christ makes us different in this world. We're different. We ought to be different in the things, the decision-making process and the goals and the, the way we, we decide how to walk in this world is, it ought to be different. We are not in step with the kingdoms of this world. Our culture is Christless. And that's why we're sojourners here. This, we're foreigners, we're strangers, we're pilgrims in this place. Christ is our king and his kingdom is our home. This earthly life then under the curse is a wilderness journey. It is temporary. It is often hard. Difficulties and trials, pain and suffering all predictably mark this path. In fact, look with me at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. What does it say? Um, chapter 4, verse 12, very plainly. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You see, beloved and friends, suffering in this world is not strange. Suffering as Christians in this place is not strange. Yes, the, the glorious paradise of Eden reverberates its echoes throughout the creation. We see glimpses of it and it causes us to hunger for it again. But it's as though there, there's this, these barbs of brokenness around every turn. And they're all there to remind us that sin separates us from God. That this is no longer a paradise. And this is no longer, therefore, our home. It is not what we were designed for. We were designed for so much more. And the most troubling, the most troubling afflictions that we could find, these barbs of brokenness, are spiritual. Not just physical. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. You can see there, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. That's our particular lot as Christians. Specifically for Christians, we have a lot of various trials in this world. Why? Why specifically us? Because we don't live according to. We live in, but not according to. The kingdom of this world. So what we have is we live in the crossfire of a clash of kingdoms. And this truly substantiates our spiritual warfare. The kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. How then do we now live? How should we step? Well, perhaps... Now, more than any time in our lives, we as Silicon Valley, 21st century West Coast Americans, now, perhaps more than any other time in our lives, we need to be recalibrated on, on the principles of sojourning, on the realities of Christ and his kingdom to come, on the power of the gospel and, and the big picture of its promise, of, of the glory of resurrection and and hope. We live in a present desert between a lost and a looming paradise. And we need to be recalibrated on that. Because in our affluent society, it doesn't always feel like a desert. But it is. Often we, we like to do all we can to make this our home. But it's not. And perhaps 2020, if it's done anything good, 
perhaps it's helped Christians to feel the weight of that. Though that goodness is not a joy, is it? It's not pleasant. It's a weight that is grievous. And I grant that we are all fatigued, that we are afflicted in our souls under prolonged government restrictions. And I fully confess that interference with the free exercise of faith infringes upon our consciences. Separation vexes our hearts. And the civil government is overreaching. We believe it is overreaching its jurisdiction and its own right, rightful power. The civil government is overreaching, and as it does so, it is harming Christ's church. Today marks 251 days. It's eight months and six days since our government has imposed restrictions upon the church here in Silicon Valley. And today we are back under lockdown conditions. Gathering is prohibited. Beloved and friends, listen, this message is about understanding that behind all of this, behind the trials that we now face, is the raging of a spiritual war, a clash of kingdoms. Now, these things are hard to understand, and they're even harder to communicate. So I pray that you would give your heart's attention and carefully think how important it is that we understand these principles for how we step as a church is a spiritual matter. First Peter will help us. And that's why we're going to take the next few weeks in First Peter. A short series that focuses on the fact that we are sojourning for the Savior. First Peter will help us because what we need here in this time especially is to hear Hear from God how we should step in submission, in suffering, and in strength as we sojourn to make much of Christ. And that's really my effort to start us with today is how then do we now live as sojourners and strangers under these conditions, separated yet again? Well, as I mentioned, there is three main, three major principles that we, we want to look at and consider how we step to help guide our decision making, to help guide our thinking, to help guide our convictions, to help guide our conscience, and to help guide even our feelings. The first is submission, the second is sufferance, and the third is strength. These are critical and major principles in First Peter, and we intend to consider them carefully, each one. Today, we'll start with submission. Now, these are not the things of preference or convenience or expedience. These are matters of principle, and the battle is won on that ground, the ground of principle. As we think about faith and as we think about obedience, we need to remember that we don't define these. They're not ours to define. They're given to us. We need to remember through it all that Christ is our king and his kingdom is our home. And therefore, we walk as we walk, as sojourners, led by our suffering sovereign. We walk according to his example. Let's just break down, and I don't have slides for you, but you can just take notes on these. I'm going to break down the major thought today on submission in three, three main principles of of coming to that. Number one is a sojourners, that we're just sojourners. We're going to understand what that means. Number two, we're going to look at submission and the call to submission. And number three, we'll end with the sovereignty of Christ. So sojourners, suffering, sovereignty to start us. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and see and get a feel for this book and what it actually teaches and the thrust of its message. It is incredibly powerful. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion 
Now that dispersion literally is just the scattered. It could be the Jewish dispersion, but this is written to, to Gentile Christians. So it's clear that, that what we're talking about is Peter's writing a letter to the church, to Christians. He calls them elect exiles. This is not their home, but they're not just strangers. They're not just foreigners. They're not just sojourners. They're exiles like they've been kicked out of their home and scattered in the northern regions around Rome. So this is clearly written to people who could relate and understand. No, very, very categorically, we aren't home. We were kicked out of our home and we're scattered due to persecution. And so this makes a lot of sense. When you're kicked out of your home because you're a Christian, you take on a whole new way of thinking about sojourning. A whole new way of thinking that this is not our home. Yeah, because your address has changed. But much more than that, it's only an object lesson. The fact that they are exiles is an object lesson. This is the theme. We're just sojourners. We're sojourners and exiles in this place. It introduces a crucial idea to the entire letter. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. The critical idea here is, again, that we are sojourners and exiles. We are different from the world. We are exiled, as it were, from the garden because of sin. We now live in this place, sojourning as though through a wilderness, from one garden to another, from one paradise to another. And in the midst, we're going through a desert. It's a spiritual desert, no matter how glamorous it may appear on the outside. The meaning here is important to understand that we are sojourners. There's another word that's used called strangers. And that's in Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. That he wrote, Paul wrote that to the Ephesian uh, Gentiles to help them understand that they are brought into the promises that God had made even through the nation of Israel. In Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16, Hebrews 11 says, verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have, been, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And lastly, in Philippians 3.20, we find that Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of this put together reminds us very clearly we are sojourners. We are, we are living in a desert between a lost and looming paradise. We are journeying to a celestial, heavenly city. We are looking for a better country, a better city. In all of these things, our citizenship is there, where Christ is. And it makes sense to understand then, with this lens, we can now see how that impacts the understanding of our world today and, and its governments. Let me just run through a couple of examples. In John 12, 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. And then in verse 31 and verse 33, John 12, 31, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. So Jesus just said, My soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, deliver me from this? No, this is why I came here. This is why I'm in this place. And what does he say? 
Now will the ruler of this world be cast out? So he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to literally displace, overthrow, conquer the ruler of this desert world. And then he says it this way, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. His point is so clear. I've come into this place, into this desert world. I'm not going to ask to be removed. I came with a mission, and the mission was to take the leadership, the government, the the prince of the power of the air, that is the devil, to take him over these kingdoms of the world and to cast him out. And I'll do it through the cross. In chapter 14, John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you. This is right before he's leaving, right? This is the night he was betrayed. He says, for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. This is critical. He says, the ruler of this world repeatedly. In Ephesians, we learn from chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, that there are those who follow the course of this world under the prince of the power of the air. And that is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You see, all of this reflects truly demonic, satanic lordship over the kingdoms of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, it works its way down right into the Jewish leaders. It says, none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the rulers of this age, everything from the Jewish rulers to the Gentile rulers who crucified Christ, the rulers of this age, they didn't understand, yet they were rulers. You see, all of this reminds us in Ephesians 6 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, what's behind all of this is a spiritual clash of kingdoms, a spiritual warfare. Now, 1 Peter, I think, is particularly relevant to us today under these conditions. I'm not, uh, I just pray that you stay with me, don't assume anything I'm saying here. Um, But take a look with me. Chapter 2, verse 11. Again, beloved, I urge you as sojourners. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 3. It says in verse 3 that we are born again to a living hope. Resurrection. It talks about resurrection. That means we're born again in this life to a living hope. It's a hope, not present but future something it's something that comes through resurrection which is future in verse 4 it's an inheritance not received now but in the future it's kept in heaven for you it's not here in the desert it's in the future verse 5 guarded through faith we walk by faith in this desert between a lost and looming paradise we walk by faith Things we trust God when we don't see the results. When we don't see his power conforming to his kingdom. When we don't see the glories of Christ in the world. When we don't see the kingdom on earth. He says in verse 5 that it's guarded through faith. And then he and it points it out that, that it's ready to be revealed. It's going to be revealed, but it's going to take a revelation. It's going to take a, something revealed. It's not here and now. And then look with me at verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Let's just stop there. And do you see the comparisons? Gold is in the desert. And he says, 
Faith is more precious in the desert than the gold. Faith is looking to an inheritance worth more than anything in the desert, anything in this wilderness, anything in this sojourn. So he's comparing the substance of what is in the sojourn in it to the substance of what awaits. More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation is tied to revelation or to ready to be revealed in verse 5. Though you have not seen him, we don't see. We live by faith. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The, 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 the clear point is that this letter is set out. It starts from the beginning. Verse 1, we're elect exiles. He's writing to elect exiles. It's scattered throughout a land. He says they've been born to a hope, something they don't have presently. He talks about resurrection, inheritance, kept in heaven, faith. All of this because the theme he's going to be addressing is sojourning. Now, I pray that circumstance that we would understand how to read the Bible like this and, and understand how to apply it even as a church collectively, but even every one of us individually. You know, circumstances sometimes afford us a greater insight into um, uh, the depth and, and even application of Scripture. The substance here becomes more relatable when we're not able, when this doesn't feel like home. We, we relate better to what God is actually saying. And new depths are discovered when we read through testing, through pain, through tears, through trials. Well, our hope is being refined today. And our focus is being recalibrated. We are sojourners, beloved and friends. Let's close that thought with chapter 2, verse 9. We are sojourners, but we are also a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are sojourners, a holy nation. Secondly, let's think about how these sojourners then live. The thrust of Peter is clear. He's established that we are sojourners. We are living in a period between a lost and looming paradise. This is not our home. How then should we live? From sojourning, it really, he catapults us to the importance and the priority of submission. So number two focus is submission. Hupakao, uh, acoustic, to hear. Hupa is to come underneath it. So we come under the hearing of something is this submission. We, we literally listen to it. We listen to it and follow it. I want you to just, just note this with me. Go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 2. In verse 1, he says that we are elect. In verse 2, he says that we are elect, and he gives a purpose clause. For obedience. We are chosen for obedience to Christ Jesus. We are sojourning for the Savior. And the way we sojourn for the Savior, instead of just sojourn for ourselves, making the best of it, the way we sojourn for the Savior is only possible through a submissive heart. Submission becomes the greatest theme of this book the most repeated, insisted, 
an illustrated exhortation. Hupaka'o speaks of obedience, it speaks of compliance, it speaks of submission, subjection. In verse 2 again, we are chosen for obedience. Look at verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So what's the point? First of all, we're chosen for obedience and we are called to be obedient children. It's something that we need to prepare in our minds. It's a way of thinking, a paradigm of processing life in the desert. We need to take on the mindset that we belong to God. This is not our home. And we therefore need to be submissive to God. Obedient to God, not conformed to ourselves or the world around us. This obedience to God is a sanctifying reality. It sets us apart, makes us central to God, or we are centered on God, focused on God. That is holy. We are called to be holy. In verse 17, he ratifies the whole thing by talking about conduct yourselves with fear. Now look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Obedience again to the truth. The gospel, verse 25, reminds us that this truth is the gospel. The gospel that was preached that saved our souls. And now we walk in light of that gospel and that sanctifies our souls. Obedience, obedience, obedience. In the fear of the Lord with holiness. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. It talks about long for the pure spiritual milk. Well, he just finished talking about the word of God, like we sang earlier and reflected upon. That the word of God is the key that reveals this gospel, this grace that, that changes us. And now we are obedient to that, to the will of God. Now, the, the, the key here in chapter 2 is he's contrasting now you as a born again newborn babe because of the word of God because of the gospel long for that word but you don't long for a word you disobey you long for a word because it gives life and part of longing for it is the appropriation of it in you for nourishment and he contrasts that in verse 8 when he specifically says they stumble because they disobey the word. So his thinking about longing for the word is a longing that includes obedience to that word. It's contrasted to those who don't obey and they suffer. In verse 12 of chapter 2, it says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they Speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Keep your conduct as a form of obedience. Keep your conduct, watch your conduct, even among those who don't believe in this sojourn, in this desert journey. And then we find a succession of hupatasso, this other word that comes in, and it literally means to come underneath an order, come underneath a line, come to be subject to, to, to bring under a firm control, to subordinate, to bring into compliance. And that's found right there in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or, and so on. Look at verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. Look at verse 18. Servants, be subject. Hupatasso again. Be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now look at this subjection. This, just like earlier, Peter's saying, your exile's kicked out of a land because the implication is there's an unjust government over you. Be subject to them. Servants, slaves, 
Be subject to your masters, even when they don't obey, even when the government doesn't obey, be subject to them. Even when your master doesn't obey, be subject to them. Wives, even when your husband doesn't obey the word, be subject to him. That's the theme. That's what he's explaining. He illustrates it with Sarah. Look at verse five, chapter three, verse five. This is how the holy, he talked about being holy, being set apart from the world. We are sojourners, different. And therefore, he says, this is how holy women who hoped in God, who didn't live for this world, who didn't live for their their pound of flesh here, who lived for the future, who had lived according to hope in God. Well, this is how they used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. In verse 6, it says that involved obedience. In chapter 4, we find verse 16 and 17. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You see, all this is going to lead to suffering at some point, right? So he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. He doesn't say... God will remove the cause of the suffering or God will exempt you from submitting. No. He says, let him not be ashamed and give glory to God. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. That's a striking thought. He just talked to people under government, slaves under masters, wives under husbands. And he said, look, even when they're disobeying, you obey When they are not honoring God, you honor God. And the difference is you are a sojourner for the Savior. You submit. And how you submit then, he describes, if you don't, he describes that as being, it's time for judgment on the church. It's time for judgment among the people of God, the household of God first. I thought thought the others were, were the disobedient ones. So now he brings it home hard. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, the implication he's inferencing here is, if you obey the gospel, you submit, even when those you submit to do not believe, do not obey the word, and are cruel and unjust. And he presents verse 16 and 17 in such a way that points out that Christians, we should expect judgment from God upon us if we don't submit like this. Well then, we see that here's the tendency of us all. We think, well, okay, and this brings on a great deal of suffering. And, and well, if we suffer, we feel entitled. If I suffer a little bit, I feel entitled to something. Like after all, you know, this, this cost me this much. It hurt that much. I, I, I deserve something. I deserve, I deserve. And I think a great majority of this epistle is addressing that very issue. It's not that you deserve. Look at what he says in chapter 5 now, verse 5. He introduces us to, uh, again, another significant principle of this subjection. And now he introduces us to tape franeo, or franuse. It's this idea of the mind being brought low. Look at verse 5, 5-5. Five, five. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves. It's as though this is the indispensable component to be subject. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. In verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore. In other words, The only way we can do this sojourn in a way that obeys the gospel, that brings glory to God, that is for the Savior, is if we submit. If we submit, we will suffer. The only way we can do that is through humility of mind. 
That's why verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. That proper time is not in the sojourn. So humble yourselves while you go through the desert when you're under an unjust government, an unjust master, an unjust husband. Subject yourself. Submit yourself. This is not a popular message. Let's go back to chapter 1. I want to show you something. Chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your, preparing your minds for action and be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, this is something that starts inside us in the way we see and understand that we were walking, sojourning in a desert between a lost and looming paradise. Look, look at now, look at chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, we just heard preparing your minds. Finally, he says in verse 8 of chapter 3, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Humility is indispensable to the call of submission. You show me a proud person, I'll show you someone who's not going to submit. Every time. 1 Peter 4, look at it with me. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. The same way of thinking. For who, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. This is so powerful. This is a massive call. This is something greater than any of us or all of us put together could possibly truly feel the weight of it. None of us. None of us feel the weight of this the way we ought to. I want to I want to help help us with that weight. I want to help us with that weight by understanding the audience. When Peter wrote this letter, what is the con what is the historical context of their situation? Well, let's see. They lived in ancient Rome. These areas, the Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, these are all the northern and in western and just sprawled out from Rome. Well, this world was a world that did not have elected officials by popular vote. It was a world that was pagan, idolatrous, immoral. It was a world that often paraded cruelty, murder was common and cheap. It was filled with debauchery, deception, corruption, bribery, conspiracies at every corner, greed, exploitation, slavery, oppression, injustice at every level of society, vengeance, there were scandals, obsessions with power everywhere. This was the world that might makes right. That's this world. That's how the Roman government ran. The strongest ran the, the empire. In politics, it was the unceasing manipulation of people. And it was the constant exercising of military force. A little bit of history on ancient Rome helps. The first century before Christ, there was a significant civil war in Rome. And what was once a republic was now in a, in a great strife. And uh, through a man by the name of Julius, it became an empire, no longer a republic. Julius and Pompey were the two primary authorities in the time. And they were fighting one another. And by 44 BC, Julius declared himself in Latin, the perpetual dictator, meaning what it says. He saw himself as the one who would never end in full power 
over the entire what then was a republic. Well, obviously other powers saw this as a threat and they assassinated him, and, uh, which was common. So his son Octavius, which he never really spent time with his father and there was a very ridiculous situation there. But Octavius joins up with another man by the name of Mark Antony. And uh, they were basically in the efforts to defeat the conspirators against Julius. And they did. But then Octavius turns against Mark Antony. So they first joined together against a common foe. And then they turned against each other. Part of it, Octavius says, because Mark Antony wouldn't marry his sister. Instead, he had eyes for Cleopatra down in Egypt. And well, that ensued into a battle in 31 BC. Octavius defeats Mark Antony. By 27 BC, he is now renamed from Octavius to Augustus. He becomes Caesar Augustus. And truly, the official assignment of the empire and its emperor is on its way. Following Caesar Augustus, we would see in history Caligula and then Claudius. And just a few years after Christ was crucified, just a few years after Christ was crucified, a man by the name of Lucius Domitius Ahana Barbus was born. Born to Gnaeus and Agrippina. Agrippina was the sister of Caligula. Lots of names. I know you can't keep it all straight. That's fine. Just follow this. From, Caesar, from Julius Caesar to Caesar Augustus, first official technical full-out emperor, moved in. From there, we have Caligula, has a sister, and then Claudius. Now, during that reign, Caligula has a baby with her husband, obviously. And uh, the problem here is that the man, the husband, was a, uh, just a wretch of a man, uh, asserted his own power in the Roman forces of military. He was known as, as again, he, he killed a man in a bar because he didn't drink all that he, he ordered. So he killed him. And that was fine. He got away with it. No problem. He then runs over a child in the street just because out of his way, he goes out of his way to run over and kill a child in the street. And that's overlooked. This is the world of this day. These are just some highlights in the headlines. Well, his father dies when he's three years old, this Lucius Domitius. His father dies when he's three. His mother then is exiled by Caligula, the emperor. Why? Because of a sex scandal. She's later then released from prison and she marries Claudius, her own relative, who then now becomes emperor and she poisons him. He dies so that her son, Lucius, can take the throne. You know Lucius by the name of Nero. Nero, then, is the man who is on the throne when Peter writes. Let's listen to what Tacitus, an ancient Roman historian, totally non-Christian, he hates the Christians. This is what he writes to the emperor. Listen to what he says in the annals of Roman history. But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor, Emperor Nero he's talking about, because there was a massive fire in Rome in 64 AD. And uh, this, this fire just debilitated the city. And the people became with great unrest. And so it says, Nero with lavish gifts and the propitiation of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order. In other words, the people thought it was him that did it. They, they began to realize, I think he's the one who actually ordered the fires. Consequently, Tacitus goes on, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians. Hmm. This is not a Christian. He doesn't, he hates Christians. This is the 
foe of Christianity, and he's writing that. No, Nero actually pinned it to them. It says this, they are made popular by the name Christus, from whom the name had its origin, who suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition thus checked, the, the, uh, checked for the movement. I'm sorry, for the moment. Again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. In other words, now Christianity has found its way in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of being a Christian. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. The government saw Christians as haters of mankind. They were guilty because of what they believed. Well, he goes on to say, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show to the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloof uh, on a car Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not, as it seemed, for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to emperor as supreme. Fear God, honor the emperor. This emperor, honor this emperor. Here's our problem. We live in a society geared to respect only what we approve. Geared to respect only in order to receive. We obey selectively. Obedience then becomes our stamp of approval. If we obey someone's authority, it's because we approve that authority. That's not the meaning of this text. And I wish I had more time to just tease out all the implications, but let me just run through our example. Christ. Think of it with me. Christ had all authority in heaven and on earth. And yet, he came... And he demonstrated the most profound submission and yielding to corrupt government. His just merely coming to the most excellent government would be terribly humbling. His coming to subject himself to the best government would be deep humiliation. He's the authority. He's the one everyone should bow to. But not only did he come and subject himself to a decent government. He came and subjected himself to this filthy emperor and his regime. And all those who preceded him, of course. Let's think about how it starts. Jesus comes into a land, the land of Israel. That land was promised to the Jews, not to the Greeks or Romans. It was promised to the Jews. It was established for the Jews. God promised it for the Jews. And Jesus comes to it. But the Jews aren't ruling the land. 
The entire Old Testament, 78% of the Bible talks about how Israel should be a theocracy. No pagans over them to submit to. Think about the mentality. What should the king of kings, the promised Messiah, what should he do when he comes? Shouldn't he just buck the pagan, idolatrous, cruel, wicked, evil government and set up the kingdom? No. Instead, it's marked specifically at his birth, the, the means for his birth fulfillment in Bethlehem, was the means of that fulfillment was through, through his sovereign majesty, through the pagan government and its overreach on the Jewish people to tax them all. You, you don't feel the weight of that. It was an unjust taxation. And yet, never once does Jesus preach against it. Never once is there petitioning, protesting, calling attention to this isn't right. We are the people of God. And a pagan government's taxing us. Instead, God decides we'll actually use their wicked schemes as a fulfillment tactic, as, as a means where I will fulfill my will. From start to finish, Christ is submissive. And throughout his ministry, he's confronted with the idea of tax. The temple tax? What do we do with the temple tax? Remember, we looked at this in Matthew 17. Jesus says, the sons are free. We don't have to pay. Are you kidding me? I own a thousand. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. But so that we don't offend, pay him. Or how about when they come to him in chapter 22? Should we give taxes to Caesar? That wicked pagan idol, idolater. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Not once did he speak against taxes. Not once. Or how about, and you might say, well, yeah, taxes are understandable. No, 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 you don't understand. Unjust taxes. Not once. How about temptation? Well, when he's tempted by the devil, the devil offers him what? All the kingdoms. Well, that civic power. And Jesus says, no, that doesn't tempt me. That's not my, that's not my way. I'm not going to take the kingdoms. I, I don't go through political means. Or how about when he's asked by someone, again, trying to trap him in Luke chapter 12 about his inheritance. Jesus doesn't say, okay, I'll assume that authority. Instead, he deflects to the proper order of civil government. And he says this in Luke 12, 13, man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? This is the king of the universe. And he says, look, that's not my role here. I'm a sojourner. My kingdom is not of this world. Instead, you go to the proper authorities to deal with that. Or how about the tower at Siloam? Do you remember this? Powerful, powerful. Luke 13, it says some at the present time, they came to him and told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate, this is all political, Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. This is a, this is a, a pagan government politically stepping into the religious sphere. And well, they're always, they were always religious anyway, but they, they, they mingled with the Jewish religion, mingling the sacrificial blood. Thousands were killed, it was said. What does Jesus say? Perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity to comment on politics. Perfect. Protest. No, he says, well, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than others? Those thousands that died because of Pilate's political power? Do you think they were worse sinners? No, they weren't. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. What? His whole point is, take your eyes off of that and understand your heart. If you don't repent, you will perish like them. Or how about in the Garden of Gethsemane? The Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is getting arrested. Do you remember what happens? He's already taught his disciples his ways. And as he's getting arrested, Peter doesn't hesitate. Pulls out a sword and strikes the ear of a soldier. Hmm. Jesus responds 
No more of this, Luke twenty two fifty one. And then he says this in Matthew 26, 52. Put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? I love this because he affirms two relevant principles about our sojourn and civil government. One is he affirms that the government has the authority to then use the sword against him. If you use the sword, you will die by the sword. The second thing he affirms is he affirms that he has the power to overrule them. But he's not. Instead, and this is the most stunning of all, breathtaking. Instead, the principle here is put in full force. Peter, do you for a second think I don't have the power to crush these fleas? No, I do. I'm choosing to submit. So he submits. And he submits knowing that they're unjust and he tells them they're unjust. In verse 55, he says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. You hear what that is? That's an appeal to justice. He's saying this is unjust. This is all in secrecy. I was in public open. Re you, you didn't do it then? If I was really a criminal, if this was justice, it would have been obvious, but it's not. He calls out their injustice and still submits to them. In chapter 27, if I had more time, we'd go into the lies in the court, the mockery, the, this mockery of a trial. And he, and he still submits to a government even when it lies to him. And then, of course, the clincher of all is when he stands before Pontius Pilate himself. He openly acknowledges that Pilate has authority over him, but he says it this way. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So, Beloved and friends, the point here is he did not resist Rome's civil authority, corrupt as it is, as it was. He is above all authority, and yet he subjected himself to this corruption through all of their evils and injustices. Should we then take on the spirit of we don't have to obey? Our government? Let's go back and close with 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at this with me briefly. Peter says, live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Don't miss that. The context is very, very clear. He's talking about submission to the government. And he's talking just like Jesus said, you're free. In other words, you're not a slave to this government. We are not a slave to Santa Clara County or the United States government. We are free. We belong to the king, the king of kings. But then he says this, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. And the evil there in its context is very, very clear. The evil is not submitting. It involves the idea of not honoring the emperor. He follows it up by immediately saying, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. If we do not submit, we take on a contrary attitude to Christ who submitted. And we do what he would count evil and call it a cover-up because we're Christians. Because we obey God. In verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. When? Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And to the wives, again, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, not only to good and gentle husbands, but to those who disobey. Implication? Not only to good and gentle governments, but to unjust governments. And here's the, here's the thing I wanted to bring you to. Look at verse 21. 
Chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. This is in the context of subjection to authorities. Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. The key is they committed sin against him. The government did. They lied against him. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. They reviled him. In response, he did not revile in return. They afflicted him with physical corporal punishment, even unto death. When he suffered, he did not threaten in return. But continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's how a sojourner lives. There's a looming paradise with a potentate that will destroy every power on earth. And we live with the powerful reminder every moment and step and drop of blood, we know a just judge will call every one of our tears to account. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. And the gospel becomes the model of our sojourn. We walk in the likeness of Christ crucified. We walk in deep humility that submits to corrupt authorities. I really wish I had more time. I know I'm over. I want to Draw your attention to a quote by Rousseau. If you follow the logic so far, and if you go on to read other things I was going to say about uh, reading out of Romans 13, out of Titus, submitting to government, you would know that at the end of the day, you're going to be thinking, well, this sounds like a doormat. Rousseau said this. I am mistaken in speaking of a Christian republic. The terms are mutually exclusive. And this is why he says this. And I think he's wrong, but listen to what he says. It's insightful. Christianity preaches only servitude and dependence. Its spirit is so favorable to tyranny that it always profits by such a regime. True Christians are made to be slaves and they know it and do not much mind for this life This short life counts far too little in their eyes. He is so spiritually dead, and yet he sees. He gets it better than most Christians get it. That if we follow the track of Christ and follow the the scriptures, we should come to the conclusion that we are marked out, favorable to tyranny. It's not to say we welcome it or want it or that we have no responsibility to thwart it, but it is to say, what is our character? This is why Rousseau thinks that Christians were so weak and that we were foolish. We we valued another life more than this life. He got it. He just came to the wrong conclusions about it. Beloved and friends, I must close with this. These are extraordinary times and, and, and extraordinary times need extraordinary leadership. But what does that look like? You might be thinking something like this. Well, what we need right now is a leader, someone who is bold enough to stand up against the government, come what may. You might be thinking that right now about Trinity Bible Church. You might be thinking that like the letter I received, which says this, and I quote, do you remember what Peter said when they told him to stop preaching? He said, you decide if it's right to obey God or, rather than man. And then later the letter says, don't think anymore, just move. Obey him and open his church. Okay, that's what some of you think. In that case, I want to make it clear that there are men and ministries that I dearly love and highly respect that have taken this course. A course that I believe lacks humility and suffering of Christ. A course that I disagree with. It is easy to lead people according to their desires and feelings. It is easy to rally people against threats that they feel. You can get a big following doing that. Leading people 
by appealing to their pride, well, it may be powerful, but it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it biblical. Extraordinary leadership is needed, and the kind of leadership that is needed for the church today is a leadership that would lead God's people in unity against the predominant feelings and desires of their flesh, against vulnerabilities and, uh, that would be countercultural, not like the culture, that would be deeply self-sacrificing, not self-preserving, for a cause greater than their earthly desires and well-being, greater than their traditions, greater than their America. No, I believe truly extraordinary leadership would call Christians to understand that you are to sojourn for the Savior and that you should tremble at the thought of civil disobedience. I dare say I have not seen anyone tremble at the thought of civil disobedience. Fearing God, understanding that he says, anyone who disobeys the authorities he puts in place, they will be judged. And entrust yourself to the one who judges justly. Don't take it into your own hands. We've put forward a large document to explain how we will walk through this as leaders. And many of you haven't read it. That hurts, especially when complaints and criticisms come. Let me just answer because I'm way over, but that's okay. This is more about shepherding than neat little sermons, isn't it? When do we disobey then, you might be asking. Well, let me just remind you, we're not zealots. We're not revolutionaries opposed to pagan rule. When do we disobey? When we tremble before God at his warning. Civil disobedience should be approached only in deep humility as an agonizing necessity forced upon us. The clearest examples in scripture are only three categories. Idolatry, that's in Daniel, both three and six. Sanctity of life, Exodus and Matthew and proclaiming Christ, Acts chapter four and five. Those are the only examples. There is no example in scripture of the church disobeying civil authorities for the sake of the church. We recognize that civil disobedience, according to the principles given to us in Scripture, depend upon one great violation, namely that it denies God his rights, not ours. Civil disobedience then is biblically or is biblical only when it is divine obedience. And some want to say, well, we're called to gather. Yes, we're called to gather, but if you're sick, you don't count it as sin to not gather. It's not a command. And let us not be afraid to think we're somehow now condoning a low view of the church. No, our reason for gathering is more a principle of love than it is law. And until we have an equivocation where this unequivocally, this law of the government unequivocally requires me to disobey God, then we ought to tremble at the thought of disobedience. Otherwise, we're like Henry David Thoreau, who says, I'll disobey a government I don't agree with. And many, many Christians are doing that today, disobeying a, a corrupt government because of all their corrupt laws. Of course they're corrupt. They're the world. That doesn't make it okay for us to disobey. When, we, when will we disobey? I need to give this to you. We will disobey when the state, county says, Status quo. This is the way it's going to be. And by the way, just to make clear, for those of you who didn't hear the announcement, as a church, I'm advocating very, very strongly here with deep conviction in the word of God, prove me otherwise, that this is the track we should take. And at the same time, submission to government does not mean passivity. It does not mean no longer are you responsible we live in a land where the written law is above the man. Therefore, we are, as a church are appealing to the written law and we're going through the judicial process and I've got a 41-page legal document appealing to this very fact. We're doing all we can to redress these corruptions that are coming down on Christ's church. When will we disobey? When we have taken every possible channel to do what's right, 
to do it in a humble manner, to do it through the proper channels, to, to address it in the best citizenry we possibly can. And then and only then, when it is status quo that we cannot gather, then we will disobey. For if the church is under a government that says you cannot gather, we will have to gather underground. We'll have to gather illegally. And we're prepared to do that. But we better not go into it headlong like a fool and not thinking carefully about what this means to Christ. Let's remember also that it's about our traditions more than it is about him. I have to close this with the thought of sovereignty. I, I got to read this to you. Chapter 3, verse 22 We've talked about sojourning, su submission, and now look at sovereignty. We submit. Why do we submit? Why does, why does Peter talk such highly about submitting? Well, because Christ is sovereign. It says in 322 that he's gone into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Everything is subjected to Christ. In chapter 4, verse 11, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. In chapter 5, verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. We submit now because our king will judge justly. We just need to make sure every step we take is in humble Christ-like humility. This I pray for us all. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. This is not our world. We sojourn for Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to look at your word. Thank you for those who've tuned in. I pray for each and every member of Trinity Bible Church in particular that you give them a heart to come in unity around your word unity in Christ, that we would sojourn not for ourselves, not for our conveniences, not to restore the tradition of the way we gather and do church, but Father, that we would, we would in fear and trembling obey even governments wherein and however much corrupt they are in whatever overreach they impose, help us, Father, to be faithful, to exercise the proper channels and to fear you above all things. So that at the proper time, if it is thrust upon us that we must disobey, you would make that abundantly clear and we would together step with unity and humility of heart. For your glory and for the joy of all in Christ, this we pray. Amen.